Hi, welcome to another episode of Theology Applied. I am your host, Pastor Joel Webin with Right Response Ministries. Today, I am joined again by Gary DeMar from American Vision, and we focus our attention this time on the man of lawlessness. This is a phrase talking about a certain individual or perhaps an entity that's described in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the man of lawlessness. And this is used by a lot of dispensational premillennials to point towards some future individual during some time of tribulation and these kinds of things. But Gary DeMar has a different opinion on the matter. Let's go ahead and tune in and find out. Big news, really big news. Our next Right Response Conference is in the works. We've got a number of things already lined up and organized. This is what we've got so far. The whole conference, three days long, on postmillennialism and theonomy. And the speakers, Dr. James White, Dr. Joseph Boot, Gary DeMar, and of course yours truly, Pastor Joel Webin. We've got a great lineup. We've got great topics. If you want to find out dates and location and registration and anything else, go and visit our website, rightresponseconference.com, rightresponseconference.com. Applying God's Word to every aspect of life. This is Theology Applied. Do you want to talk about the man of lawlessness? Do you have a little bit of time or you want to maybe yeah, do it another Yeah, we'll day? do the man of lawlessness. All right, so let's go ahead and look at, uh, this is going to be what, first, Second Timothy? Second Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians 2. Okay. Um. <clears throat> I'm having to type. Second Thessalonians in. two. Go ahead. Uh, and it says here, now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I believe this coming is the same coming that Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter twenty-four. Coming okay. is lightning, right, uh, on the clouds, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, on the cloud. That, that, then he talks about coming on the um, coming on the, the, the clouds of heaven, et cetera. This isn't the second coming. It isn't a rapture, and. And I'll try to explain this in a little bit. Uh, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our synagoguing together with him hmm. or to him. Again, what is this? I think it goes back to Matthew chapter 24, uh, verse 31. And there's an interesting passage in John, if I can remember where this is. John um, 11. John 11. This is, again, one of these things. <clears throat> this is what Jim Jordan calls the weird. You know, something just kind of thrown in there, and you just don't really know what is going on here. Um, so John chapter 11, verse 47. It says, Therefore the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council and were saying, What are we doing? For this man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, all men will, fall, will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But a certain one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you take into account that it is expedient for you that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation should, be, should not perish. Nailed now, it. Caiaphas <laughs> was probably thinking here, we get rid of this guy and the nation <clears throat> will be saved. Right. And but then it goes. Now he did not. He now this he did not say on his own initiative. So this must have been something that the Holy Spirit put into him as a prophetic announcement. But he had no idea what in the world he was talking about. But being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation. Again, not what he thought. Right. And not for the nation only, but that he might also gather together, that he might synagogue together into one, the children of God who are scattered abroad. And what is described here is, is that the gospel went out to the entire Roman Empire and God was synagoguing, gathering people together, the Jews from around the Roman world. The gospel goes into all the world. This is what Matthew Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, goes through the whole oikumene, uh, to every creature under heaven, as, as Paul writes in, in, in Colossians um, 123. Uh, Paul says to all the nations in um, 
First, Thess- First uh, Timothy chapter three and Romans chapter sixteen. This this gathering together, and at the same time as this gathering together of the Jews takes place, it's the gathering together of the Gentiles taking place, and also I think related to all these Old Testament saints, this whole gathering, this synagoguing together of one new people in Christ, mm-hmm. and so so. This is what is being dealt with here. This isn't talking about the rapture of the church. It isn't even talking about the second coming. It's in verse 2, that you may not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Now, Hmm. if this refers either to the rapture, which it doesn't, or the second coming, which it doesn't, but they, a lot of people who take this passage believe that it does, then why in the world would they have thought that they, how would they have thought that they had gotten a letter from Paul, that this had taken place already? Right. How could he have written the letter if he was in the rapture or if this was the second coming? It makes no right. sense. So this has got to be talking about something that was taking place in their day and that the Lord has come. And, now, that, and that was also something taking place in their day and that was uh, local. Yeah, yeah, it was it was within the empire, and so this is my speculation. They had gotten they they knew that that Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. They knew there was there was this judgment coming. They knew it was going to take place before their generation passed away. They knew that there were fellow Christians who were living in Jerusalem. That's why you know you get Jesus says in Matthew chapter twenty three when you see these things happen, you see the abomination. Uh, desolation sitting in the place where it ought not to be, head for the hills. Uh, you have Luke in Luke 21 says, when you see Jerusalem f- surrounded by armies. And so maybe they thought at this particular period of time that this had already happened and they had not gotten any news about what happened. What happened? Did they, did they make it outside the city? Uh, did the Romans come in and do all of this? They didn't know. And so this isn't talking about the second coming of Christ, because why in the world would they have, you know, heard this from Paul or gotten a, seemingly gotten a letter from Paul that this had taken place if because he would have been taken to heaven in a rapture or the second coming. Now, then it goes on, says, let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. And so this wasn't going to take place until this man of lawlessness appears, whoever he might be. And I don't know, there's, there's all kind of speculation of who the man of lawlessness was. Uh, some believe he had something to do, <clears throat> that he had something to do with the temple, uh, that he was uh, uh, a high priest. It was a corrupt high priest and so forth and so on who takes That's a seat That's kind of what it sounds temple. like, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God uh, or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. <clears throat> By taking his seat in the temple, he essentially says, I'm, I'm, I'm the guy right now. I'm the one in control of all this. And keep this in mind, that the temple was being rebuilt, and it was a spectacular temple, and the temple was being... Um, dedicated in A.D. 64. And I think this is exactly what Peter was talking about in 2 Peter chapter 3, talking about scoffers. The scoffers were saying, hey, yeah, your Jesus talked about that he was, <clears throat> that he was going to come within a generation and destroy the temple. And look at this glorious temple that we have here. Right, right. It's still standing more glorious than ever and ever and ever and ever. Your Jesus is a fraud. And so this, this man of lawlessness takes his seat in the temple, essentially blaspheming that Jesus was a fraud. Right. He wasn't the Savior. He wasn't who he said he was. He was a false prophet and so forth and so on. Now, again, I'm I'm speculating because Paul isn't saying this. I'm just trying to put a couple of things right. together. Here. And particularly, and I know, I think you're probably about to do this, but <clears throat> if you're not, so th- this man could be a high priest, but it's associated with the temple. This is not a man, number one, this is not about the second coming. It's not something that's far off in the distance. Th- this is something that's that's soon. And it's not a man in the church. It's not the man of lawlessness in the church. It's the man of lawlessness in the temple. And right, that and yeah. yeah. Now, now keep in mind that through, throughout the Reformation <clears throat> era, they took the temple here as being the church. Right. And, 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 and I get that. They, and I, and, they, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. 
papacy was the antichrist and that's and they, fu right. they futurized this we okay. had a little bit of that talk last time i had you come on the show but like and and i love the reformers but i i completely understand what you're saying in the sense that that this is talking about it seems as though it's talking about judaism yeah i, I believe so and there and there is a i have a uh i had an appendix in an earlier uh, uh edition of last day's madness by a man who finished John Lightfoot's commentary on the New Testament. John Lightfoot wrote up until, I think, 1 Corinthians. I think that's as far as he get. And this German came along, German Bible expositor came along and finished it. And I could read enough Latin to figure out that what this guy was writing about 2 Thessalonians 2 was exactly what I what I was describing here. So I had I had a fellow translate 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and that is exactly what this guy was saying, that this apostasy that was taking place was taking place in the first century. John talks about the apostasy that was taking place. There were those who were of us, who were among us, who really not were, were not of us, ended up leaving, departing. Uh, uh, Paul talks about savage wolves will come into the, into the church. There was a small apostasy leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. This is probably what, what John is talking about, the synagogue of Satan. Uh, these were these were people who claimed to be Jews and be, be believers, but they really weren't. They abandoned they abandoned Christ. And then you get to verse um, five. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? Uh, and you now verse six. And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he may be revealed. So whoever this guy was, whoever the man of lawlessness was, he was alive in Paul's day because he was being restrained in Paul's day. Something's holding him back. Something is holding him back. And again, what, what is it that, that's holding him back? We don't know. Some people speculate it was the Roman Empire was holding him back because if you, if you read through the, the book of Acts, somebody, what you ought to do, my uh, pastor is, is going through the book of Acts. He's just about finished with it. And you read the book of Acts. And the Romans are not the bad guys. The, 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 he, there were a couple. I mean, Paul was 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 uh, punished, et cetera, and, and um, uh, Rome, um, Acts chapter sixteen. But right. for the most right. part, Christians were left alone by the Roman government. Uh, if you if you if you uh, the, the little thing that was going on with, uh, under Gallio, uh, he he essentially protected Paul. He said, "Look, I'm not getting involved in your disputes." The, the, the Romans saved Paul when a, when a message had come, I think from Paul's nephew, uh, that there was a plot to kill the Apostle Paul. So the bad guys in the book of, of, book of Acts are the Jews. And if you look at, uh, if you look at uh, second, second Corinthians chapter 11, Paul denounces uh, the, his own countrymen. They were the ones who st almost stoned him to death beat him with with lashes you know right, uh, right. 39 lashes and so forth so the roman empire kept the jews from killing christians i mean paul apostle well not he wasn't the apostle paul but saul accomplished a little bit of this in act in acts chapter 7 when he killed uh stephen and in acts chapter 8 he was taking people out of their homes and persecuting them and so forth. But the Roman government right. later stepped in and stopped all this. Well, if it hadn't on. been the will of God, I mean, it seems like, you know, yeah. Pi Pilate would have stopped them from killing Jesus. Yeah. 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 So look, so it says here, and you know, re you know what restrains him now so that in his time he may be revealed for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. So we don't even have to know who the man of lawlessness is or was. We do know that he was alive in Paul's day. Mm -hmm. And we know that the temple was still standing in Paul's day. And so this isn't describing a rebuilt temple. This is talking about the temple that was still in Jerusalem. And it's, I think one of the reasons why this is somewhat cryptic to us is because Paul in this letter talks about, he had talked about this already with them. So they had already had some background knowledge of this uh, before he wrote this. So he's kind of updating them with some, maybe some more details because maybe they, you know, that he found out that they, uh, that, that uh, a message had gotten to them that the, the, the day of the Lord, that is the destruction of Jerusalem had already come. So anyway, uh, 
that's what I believe the second uh, that the man of lawlessness is, is was, he was alive in Paul's day, had something to do with the temple. Uh, and uh, he was he was judged and the temple was judged as well. And I have two chapters on this, I, much, much more detailed than this. Um, in my book, Last Day's Madness, uh, I go through a pr pretty extensive detail on uh, Second Second Thessalonians 2 and the Man of Lawlessness. Great. Well, that's really helpful, Gary. Thank you so much. So let's go ahead and land the plane now. I want to give you the final word with just... <laughs> With the man of lawlessness, with the rapture, with eschatology, with post-millennialism, preterism, all, the whole nine yards, um, what, what do you think, Christians who are looking into these things, like what does the Bible say about the end? What is the Bi and, and what does the Bible say about my responsibility and what I should be doing now? What, what would be maybe a final, even yeah. pastoral word to people? And this, and this is why I got involved in all this. Uh, in fact, uh, I, was, I was down in Mexico last month. I spent... Uh, five days down in Mexico speaking to uh, pastors down there. And I explained to them, I, the fellow who wanted me to come down there um, wanted me to deal with, deal with eschatology. And right. I said, you sure? And I said, he says, yes, I want you to deal with eschatology. And I explained to, to, these, to these men that the reason I got involved in the whole eschatological thing was because of the worldview material. Uh, the first book I wrote, first series of books I wrote was, God and government it was a three volume work on God and government, not God and politics, mm -hmm. but God and government, that God's government is over everything. And right. he has established self-government, family government, church government, and civil government. Right. We are right. to apply the Bible to every area of life. Look, th this world does not belong to the devil. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if, you know, they say, well, what about that passage in second Corinthians four, where it talks about you know Satan is the god of this world. No, no Satan is the god of this age, right. and the age is that those who have uh, uh, you know rejected Jesus as the promised Messiah, and in es essence, took on Satan as their as as their god. They there's no neutrality. You got either one god or another god. Right. And so I, I I told them that this eschatology thing has to be settled because it's a hindrance to people. Because every time they see something bad happen, they say, oh, it's got to be the end of the world. Oh, yeah. there's nothing we can do about it. This has all been foretold in the Bible. Uh, and as a result of that, I think that's one of the reasons why we're in the mess we're in today. I think so. So eschatology, everybody has an eschatology. This is another thing I tell people. Everybody has an eschatology. Mm -hmm. Every a An atheist has an eschatology. This mm -hmm. Scientists uh, the, everybody, the Islam has an eschatology. You can't get away from an eschatology. It's all there. Right. Liberalism has an eschatology. That's why they're on the winning side in so many ways. Well, th that's funny. Real quick, my thought on that, though, the, your radical, I don't know about liberalism, you know, in general, but your radical leftists like AOC and people like that, they, they have an es eschatology, the one they actually believe, and then they have a second eschatology, which is the one they say when the camera's on, right? So the, 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 the spoken eschatology is the world's going to end in 12 years because of the climate. Yeah, right. But, but what they actually believe is, is post-millennial. The world's going to go on for a very long time and we're going to win. Yeah, and they're and see they're, yeah. the way they're going to win is they're going to they're going to control the future, and that's what they want. And, and they said, and give us more teach power, kids. give us more money. We can handle this world better than you can. Islam has an eschatology. They, yep. they, they, the Islamists believe they are on the winning side. Right now, Christians say, "Well, we're on the winning side too," and that's the rapture. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> all right. That's a, kind of an interesting way to say you're right. on the winning side. And in one in, in one respect, I guess that's the case. Yeah. But right. yeah, you're going to be raptured and you're going to be winning. Mm -hmm. uh, but is that what does the Bible teach that? I don't believe it does. Right. I've been the, the little phrase that I've been using lately that a few people have told me they've said that I think that's helpful is I think the difference between your dispensational pre mill versus, you know, a post millennial eschatology is um, to be fair and to not straw man either side. To be fair, both sides believe that Jesus wins, that Jesus is victorious. Yeah. I think the difference is that the, the dispensational premillennial believes that Jesus wins despite a losing church, and the postmillennial believes that Jesus wins through a militant and triumphant church. I think yeah, that, I, I, yeah, it's I how think does Jesus win? He wins good. in both scenarios, but how does he win? Yeah, R.J. Rushdoony, uh, in his book, The Mythology of Science, I wish I could grab a hold of it real quick and read it, but he essentially said this. God is in control and sovereign and everything, but 
he he put us down here and it's hard <laughs> it's difficult we're not god we're limited we're going we're going to we're going to fail in our life. We're going to die. All of these types of things. But if God really wanted to, to really get us out of here, why doesn't he just save us at the time that we, we come to, we come to right. Christ? Why has he left us here for you know, you know, two, nearly 2,000 years? Uh, to do what? To wait for the rapture to take us out of here or wait for the second coming? I don't believe so. The mm-hmm. God, this is God's world. Satan is, in control, is not in control of this world. That's in right. essence, we are proxies of what, what, what God wants us to do. God wants us to apply his word to every area of life. That was, always the, that was always the thing that was supposed to take place. And why do we think that that has changed? It's more difficult now, but I think that's just the nature of what it means to be a Christian in a in a world that's limited and, 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 in essence, sinful as well. God left us here to apply his word in every area of life and told us to get busy doing that. Amen. And I think having, having the right view of the future has helped me tremendously, so there's not a hindrance in my way. And also having a better view, and I'm not there yet, I'm still working on it, but having a better view of the past, and especially recent past with America, right? You know, that, that you're told, you know, so going through like some of the... Um, some of the history conferences and things that like Doug Wilson and guys have put on, uh, Steve, Stephen uh, Wilkins, I believe Wilkins, was one of the, right. yeah, it has been so helpful <laughs> to hear like, okay, maybe, maybe not all the founders were deist. And maybe the reason why the history that you've read said they were all deist is because the history books have been written by atheists and they don't want you to think that yeah. they were Christian. Yeah, the winners, the winners write the history right, books. I, right. I, so, have a, I have a brand yeah. new book coming out <clears throat> called uh, The Case for America's Christian Heritage. Good. Praise but the, God. Fi- the, the final touches on it this week. I'm just waiting for the cover to come back, and then I got some tinkering to do with the conclusion. Where, where can people get that? Because I, I want to send people. They can get any that. anything that I do, I do is you can get it at AmericanVision.org. Okay. AmericanVision.org. I got Last Day's Madness. Is Jesus coming soon? Um, uh, wars and rumors of wars. I have a, a, a book that I did called The Case from. Let's see. It's called. Uh, 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 no, it's it slipped my mind. Uh, uh, America's Christian History, The Untold Story, which we're offering right now. We've republished a book called uh, Christ- The Christian Life and Character of the Civil Institutions of the United States. But I wanted to do something that was kind of a, um, a, a jazzy, four-color book that you could give to friends, lots of images in it and so forth and so forth. So forth. It's not a technical book. It deals with original source documents. And I, it, it deals with a mixture of a lot, Enlightenment philosophy and Christianity. And Enlightenment philosophy infected some aspects of Christianity, but Christianity tempered the full effect of Enlightenment, of the Enlightenment. And remember, the Enlightenment came up, grew up out of a Christian worldview, made it all possible. And, but the Enlightenment arose in the period of a Christian worldview before Darwinism came, came along in 1859. Mm-hmm. And so we are now living with essentially the full orb, uh, full court um, press of an Enlightenment philosophy no longer grounded uh, in some Christian ideals. I mean, John Adams, John Adams, George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, even Thomas Jefferson were living within the context of a Christian worldview. Right. I mean, Tom, Thomas Jefferson you know, took the, the the Gospels and cut out all the miracles and so forth and so right. on on that. Right. But he he couldn't he he couldn't uh, extract himself from the morals of Jesus. You you, right. you can't account for morality in a Darwinian world. Yeah. He he was from what I've heard. Even today, I was listening to some guys saying like he's a Unitarian uh, Jefferson, but. But then people will say that, you know, George Washington is a deist, but then you can find, you know, a deist, you have to define in, in well, what is a deist, you know, and like in, in those days, it, it would have been somebody who denied the divinity of Christ and denied special revelation, that, that they did not believe. Well, de- yeah, a deist spoke, was more you know. of God. Yeah, there was God. They believed in God. Uh, and they, But they denied the Trinity. They denied the divinity well, of Christ. Well, Unitarians, Unitarians denied the Trinity. Trinity, of course, Thomas Jefferson did too. John Adams John Adams, it's you go back and forth with John Adams. He was a very young man. He was very orthodox in his theology. 
uh, and all the way up until one of his Thanksgiving proclamations, reads like it's a Trinitarian, Trinitarian perspective. Uh, but uh, what 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 you find here is is that uh, the, the 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 founders, a deist was somebody who believed that God created the world and He abandoned the world. Right. And he's no. But if you read, right, you right. read the Declaration of Independence that Thomas Jefferson had a, you know, a lot, a lot to say about it. Uh, God is the one who is the the, the judge of the world. Mm-hmm. I mean, wait a minute. How, how can you how can you say that? He, he, if you're a deist and you don't believe that God's involved in the world, how can you say that He is in fact the the, the, the judge of the world? We are endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights. And so forth. So you're right. You're right. You have to define these terms right. very precisely. And, and my only point was to say that, yeah. from my understanding of how how it's defined, George Washington would not be a deist. He he, in some of his letters, even uh, affirmed. I mean, he was sent regularly. People would send him sermons from from pastors and like, oh, George Washington, would you read this sermon? And, and he would respond, say, I read this sermon and and I approve of its evangelical doctrine. Yeah. You oh, yeah. So, I mean, you got uh, Benjamin Franklin who stood up with the. Constitutional Convention and uh, gave this, you know, you know uh, God governs in the affairs of men, mm-hmm. and how, how how could a, a sparrow fall to the ground without his without his knowledge and so forth and so on? I mean, th- that uh, he, that is not a a a, a deistic deistic statement, right? Uh, but these yeah. guys, they all they all lived within the context of a Christian world. That's right. And this is why I believe what you're finding today in our culture is an attack on Christianity mm-hmm. because an attack Christianity is the last bastion against a full orb materialistic worldview that they're trying to push on us uh, from, from around the world. This is what they want. They got to get Christianity out of the way because Christianity has a transcendental moral foundational complex that keeps other people's morality in check. Right. Agreed. Well, so we need to have an accurate view of the past, and we need to have a biblical view of the future. And whatever we do, even on the things that we disagree on, we need to um, we need to obey all of Christ, all of His commandments in every every avenue of life. Amen. Right. I agree. All right, Gary. Thanks so much for coming on the right. show. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Joel. Appreciate it. Wait, wait, wait. Real quick, before you go, do me a favor. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Click the bell so you'll be notified with all our new content as it comes out on a daily basis. And if you're willing to support this ministry, you can do so by going to rightresponseministries.com slash donate. Thanks so much. God bless.